Welcome to this, our session on the future of Christian higher education, a panel discussion. I'm John Cavadini. I teach here in the Department of Theology, and it's my privilege to be able to introduce our panel of speakers for this afternoon. And we'll proceed in the following way. I, I will introduce each speaker as their turn comes to speak, and each will make a short presentation. And after that, um, we'll have a discussion with questions from the floor, etc. OK? I'm proud to be able to present and to welcome back to the Notre Dame campus as our first speaker, Charles J. Doherty, who is president of Duquesne University. He is, however, well known to many of us on campus as an alum of this university, holder of both an MA and a PhD in the Department of Philosophy at the University of Notre Dame. Before serving as president of Duquesne, Professor Doherty served as vice president for academic affairs at Creighton University with one term as acting president. He was director of the Creighton Center for Health Policy and Ethics, as well as chair of the Department of Philosophy and a professor in that department. Somehow in the midst of all of these duties, he has found the time to write six books, all on issues at the intersection of philosophy, ethics, and healthcare. His most recent book, Back to Reform, Values, Markets, and the Healthcare System was published by Oxford University Press. I'm sure you'll all join me in welcoming to the podium Professor Charles Doherty. Thank you, John, for the kind introduction. It's a, it is a pleasure to be back. The question is, uh, before us is the future of uh, Christian higher education. Uh, I, spent, I spent all my life, including kindergarten, in uh, Catholic higher education. So if I slip into that phrase instead of Christian, uh, uh, please forgive me. I realize where uh, the net is wider. Um, my assessment in a word is th that the future is bright. Uh, but uh, before I get to the argument for that, let me just state the case for why we should be con concerned. I think United States society is drifting toward an amorphous spirituality and away from most of the mainline Christian churches that have built Christian uh, higher ed. So to the extent that Americans feel less identification with those denominations, uh, they may likely be less interested in the higher education those denominations offer. There was a strong push over the last generation, maybe over the last two. Uh, I know this is true in, in Roman Catholic circles. Towards secularization uh, and away from the uh, founding missions of our universities. Not, I believe, as an end in itself, uh, but as the presumed means to improvements in academics, student life, and other administrative practices. Uh, not to put too fine a point on it, I think the reasoning was uh, we have to be less Catholic, less denominational if we were really going to be great universities. Christian higher ed is also private higher ed, and we are becoming very expensive, uh, and that is a challenge for all of us. At the very same time, universities that I would say are at the second and third rung in the public sector have either improved dramatically or are perceived to have improved dramatically and have become real competitors for what was a, um, a quality niche that many of us had. The push for diversity is a challenge for us. On the one hand, diversity works well with Christian universalism. Our message is universal. Uh, diversity should be no real challenge for us. We should welcome it. Yet on the other hand, it can act to dilute the presence of Christians on our campus 
by our encouragement of the representation of others. Uh, and it can compromise, in some cases, the expression of our mission. I know when, when we at Duquesne uh, consider uh, public religious events, there's always a discussion whether it should be a mass or not. Because if it's a mass, uh, many of our international students and other uh, people who are not Catholic uh, may feel uh, alienated from that. Uh, the other argument, of course, if it's an interreligious, non-denominational uh, prayer service, uh, doesn't that say uh, something uh, about our own loss of uh, a center? Many of us followed with some um, uh, interest a few years ago. Georgetown University's uh, spat about uh, crucifixes and crosses in their uh, classrooms and, and uh, uh, all the, the sides of those issues that arose. Uh, I think many of our Christian universities had a clear goal at the founding, and the pressure of events have changed those goals. It was quite plain in, in our case. Uh, there were Catholic immigrants working in the steel uh, mills and in the coal mines who were being discriminated against in terms of higher education. Uh, and uh, the Holy Ghost congregation came to Pittsburgh uh, to offer uh, education for uh, that group. Uh, that's no longer our main uh, target group, of course. Uh, the economy has changed. Uh, we used financial aid to support uh, those families in the beginning. We use financial aid for many different things now, including uh, encouraging the, the very best uh, enrollments of our top scholars. On the other hand, th there are uh, needs of all of our universities for development, uh, that is, to raise money. Uh, and that can make us hostage to a whole range of demands uh, from important uh, donors who may have other agendas. There is, in, in many quarters, a resistance from faculty members to too much stress of mission. Um, many faculty members, I think, certainly early in their careers, identify more with their disciplinary peers than they do with the institutions that they're uh, serving, uh, and therefore want their institutions to be the same as the institutions of their uh, disciplinary peers. And then I would say in terms of the challenges, uh, this is especially true in Roman Catholic circles, there are declining uh, numbers of uh, the religious in our founding organizations has created a challenge in leadership uh, and has created some uh, transition issues uh, to, to lay uh, leadership. So how can, how can things be bright against uh, that background? Uh, here's the other side of it. Uh, I think now, and it probably for the last 15 years, maybe more, there's been a counter movement to that secularization on our campuses. And I think that there is a growing sensitivity among all constituencies at our universities uh, that however unclear this new content may be to us, that the religious mission is defining of our identity and to lose it is to lose part of who we are. It's to lose a sense of self. I think even the more, uh, even the more uh, hard bitten and cynical among us see that to lose that identity is to lose a market niche. It's to lose uh, a reason for being economically. I think associated with this realization is the need to become more intentionally mission oriented. That once was presumed, now must be deliberate. Uh, and I see this happening in, in, in a curriculum reform and in student activities uh, and in concern about the culture on our campuses. Uh, I think the strategy that many of us are using of hiring for mission, which has become a, a phrase of art, is a hopeful sign that renewal of faculty will bring on to our campuses those who want to be with us because of who we are. Um, my own experience when I was an academic vice president, uh, we were committed to the inter interviewing myself, uh, the finalists for every faculty position uh, in the university, 10 to 20 a year, multiplied by three finalists. So it was quite a, a commitment. Of course, I didn't know all the disciplines involved, but my question was, how do you see yourself contributing to a Catholic university? And it wasn't, are you a Catholic? I never asked that question. The question was, how do you see yourself fitting in and contributing to a Catholic university? A lot of ways to answer that, uh, but red flags went up uh, when some people couldn't or wouldn't answer it. I think there's a hunger for values in the United States, and I think our universities are part of the answer to that. I think we fill that need, we respond to that hunger. Our mission traditionally on, uh, our, our mission emphasis traditionally on service is supportive of service learning at a very much deeper level than I think the conversation that's been going on for the last five or 10 years is. And of course on 
volunteering across the board. It's my experience now that students seem especially open to religious questions today. Uh, they may be open in a non-conventional way, uh, but I think it gives us the possibility of attracting and educating uh, mass numbers of students. Um, one a small snippet, when we had our 9-11 uh, commemoration. Uh, we had three religious events in the morning, in the middle of the day, and in the evening. They were overwhelmed with uh, students. Uh, late in the afternoon, we had an academic event in which we had faculty members talking about what did 9-11 mean, what's the future between Islam and Christianity. Very poor turnout. So my sense is that the students regarded this event as visceral, not intellectual. Uh, and that it was part of their uh, uh, religious relationship to the, uh, to the issue. Uh, certainly on, on the loss of uh, the re religious leadership in many of our institutions, uh, Duquesne, for example, had its first lay president in 1988. I'm the second. Uh, St. Bonaventure, my undergraduate uh, um, alma mater, uh, first lay president in the 90s. Uh, Georgetown, first lay president last year. Uh, Dayton, uh, first lay president this year. So this is a, a phenomenon in Catholic universities. And, and I think there's a lot of bumps in the road, but I think once, it's, once it occurs, the alumni, the board, uh, uh, fall behind the new leaders, and I think these transitions are being made uh, well. Finally, I'll end with this. Uh, in terms of, um, of, of the brightness of our future. I think those of us who are in Christian higher education, uh, by the very nature of what we're committed to, uh, have to believe that our work is aided by the Holy Spirit. Uh, and that, of course, is no guarantee of our success individually or collectively. Uh, but I think it's a guarantee that we have a role in providence uh, no matter what uh, direction it takes us. Thank you. Thank you, for Professor Doherty. I'm proud to be able to present as our second panelist, Dr. Robert B. Sloan, Jr., President and Chief Executive Officer of Baylor University. Dr. Sloan became the 12th President of Baylor University on June 1, 1995, leaving his position as Founding Dean of Baylor's George W. Truitt Theological Seminary. Dr. Sloan holds a BA from Baylor and is a graduate of Princeton Theological Seminary, where he earned the Master of Divinity degree. He conducted post-baccalaureate research in church history at the University of Bristol, England from 1973 to 74, and earned the doctoral degree in signi cum laude from the University of Basel, Switzerland in 1978. Dr. Sloan joined the faculty of Baylor's Department of Religion in 1983. In 1990, he became the first holder of the George W. Truett Chair in Evangelism at Baylor and was appointed Dean of Truett Seminary shortly thereafter. Sloan has held positions as pastor or interim pastor of more than 20 churches in Texas, Oklahoma, New Jersey, and Germany. From 1991 to 92, he was president of the Southwest Commission on Religious Studies. He is a member of the Society of Biblical Literature, the Southwest Biblical Seminar, the Institute for Biblical Research, the National Association of Baptist Professors of Religion, and Studiorum Novi Testamenti Societas. He has authored two books, assisted with editing of several books, and published more than 50 articles and chapters in scholarly journals and other publications. I must add that Dr. Sloan was selected for induction in the Little League Hall of Excellence, along with Baltimore Orioles shortstop Carl Cal Ripken, Jr. I'm sure you'll join me in welcoming to the podium Dr. Robert B. Sloan. <laughs> John, thank you very much. Um, that was a nice introduction, and 
I knew when he paused there right at the end, he was going to say one of two things. He was either going to mention the Little League thing or that uh, my wife and I have seven children. And uh, usually one of those gets a little reaction uh, from people. Uh, so wonderful to be here with you where uh, in an institution where I suppose having seven children isn't all that remarkable. <laughs> but in Baptist circles, that uh, gets raised eyebrows. Good to be with you, and thank you for the um, for the opportunity to to speak. I understand that uh, this is the third uh, of conferences having to do with uh, the culture of uh, life, and uh, that this third conference uh, speaks to the issue of uh, from death to life, and asks uh, specifically about uh, agendas for reform. Uh, vis-a-vis -vis higher education and how we can, as uh, uh, within the world of higher education, uh, bring life uh, to our culture and, and, and or be agents of, uh, of life uh, through our students uh, who uh, act within our culture. Of course, um, it, it is a pleasure to be here, and in some small way, though there are many representatives of Baylor University here today, in some small way to represent the university on this particular occasion. I had the opportunity uh, to be here, um, well, it's been three or four years now to uh, participate in a conference on faith and learning, and then uh, sad to say, well, there were several nice things that happened. Uh, the publication of the uh, was it the lack of the Irish, uh, Ralph, that uh, came out on that occasion uh, from Ralph McInerney? Did I get? I think I got the title right. And uh, hey, one of the biggest honors of my life, I, I should put that in my resume, is I've been mentioned in a Father Dowling mystery. Uh, that that should go in. Uh, and um, but uh, Notre Dame, unfortunately for us, uh, took care of us on the gridiron uh, that same weekend. Uh, our fortunes uh, continue much the same, while I understand that Notre Dame's have taken a dramatic turn for the good lately. So congratulations in that regard. To provide some context about my remarks today, um, I want to, to say the following. And again, I'm, I want to speak to the question of, uh, uh, at least for me, an agenda within higher education that has taken place at Baylor that speaks to the question of, um, of life and how we hope to influence culture uh, for the good. Our Board of Regents, some 36 individuals, passed almost a year ago uh, this month a vision that we call Baylor 2012. It's a 10-year vision document uh, that has uh, proven to be, thus far, a very significant document uh, in the things that we're doing at the university. In one way, in one way, the the uh, central objective, one of the objectives of this ten-year uh, vision statement, Baylor 2012, is rather modest. On the other hand, it's not modest at all. I'll, I'll read the following paragraph: uh, within within the course of a decade, Baylor University intends to enter the top tier of American universities while strengthening and deepening its distinctive Christian mission. I hope you'll allow for the fact, of course, that uh, tenure uh, vision statements uh, do have to go on slick brochures, and uh, one puts these out uh, for various reasons. Uh, but I, I do want to say that our tenure vision is not uh, simply a matter of, uh, of public relations or of fundraising. Uh, it, it is an effort at a rather comprehensive statement uh, for our university in terms of the shape of our university, the direction that we want to go. It talks about uh, assumptions, uh, critical assumptions and core convictions. It has, uh, these are very theological in nature. Um, uh, it has some 12 imperatives and then it has a, a list of specific projects. <laughs>
university, rightly positioned, can hope to impact contemporary culture and in so doing, leave a lasting mark. A Christian university can influence culture, one, by educating students morally. This is a very basic calling and one that all Christian institutions of higher learning, be they comprehensive universities or small colleges, ought uh, to be uh, busy about. Secondly, uh, preparing students, uh, and I won't make the argument for the necessity of that. I, I think that uh, should be obvious. I hope it is. Secondly, I think uh, all Christian institutions can and should uh, prepare students for leadership. The process of preparing uh, students uh, for leadership uh, thus goes beyond merely uh, setting examples of high moral character or even the processes of nurturing uh, integrity and character, uh, but uh, leadership, though it uh, works uh, out of the reservoir of character and integrity, involves even a different uh, set of habits and characteristics. Leadership involves, again, more than mere technical competence. It relies on the cultivation of habits of the heart that include integrity, courage, risk-taking, and wisdom. Now, both of these uh, foregoing functions, that is, uh, educating students morally and preparing students for leadership, should be shared by all true institutions, it seems to me, of Christian higher learning. Beyond those, though, I think there are two more ways of impacting culture that are legitimate uh, provenance uh, of institutions that also uh, undertake uh, serious research and the development of new knowledge. I have invoked of research scholarship. I do so, I do not do so in the uh, with the connotation uh, suggested uh, in the uh, uh, perhaps uh, perverse habits that many institutions of higher learning have developed, namely uh, the publication of obscure articles uh, as, a, as a metric for success. I'm referring to the idea found in uh, Mark Knoll's book, The Scandal of the Evangelical Mind. Quote, in appealing for Christian scholarship, the point is not primarily academic respectability and certainly not the mindless pursuit of publication for its own sake that bedevils the modern university. And all of us know, uh, this is not Noel here, but uh, I'm speaking, uh, reminds me of that Pauline expression in 1 Corinthians, uh, not the Lord, but I. Uh, the, uh, the point is that there's a certain, there are many economic constraints and patterns that dictate what the modern research university is doing and the, the vicious cycle that they find themselves in. But uh, Noel continues, the point is rather that the comprehensive reality of Christianity itself demands specifically Christian consideration of the world we inhabit. I think in that succinct phrase, uh, Noel makes the case uh, for uh, the necessary uh, work of discovery on the part of uh, Christian institutions. And in so doing, I think uh, that resonates with uh, St. Paul's uh, uh, remark in 2 Corinthians that he seeks to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. I think, I think Christian consideration of the world then manif uh, manifests itself in two other uh, ways. I mentioned four ways that I think uh, Christian institutions uh, should uh, seek to influence culture. So thirdly, I, this notion of, uh, of a research uh, activity and agenda suggests the following. Now, thirdly, that it is important for the Christian university to analyze and critique culture. The Christian university should be in the business of addressing the dominant paradigms and ideologies extant in contemporary society and providing uh, analysis and critique of them. Much of what passes in modern society uh, or postmodern society um, is, is reflective of no core principles whatsoever, indicative of no clear uh, underlying worldview, or at least not a very coherent one. The Christian scholar has a role to play in calling a spade a spade. The Christian scholar has a role to play in holding the thoughts of, of colleagues in secular institutions, uh, calling them to account for consistency and integrity, whether in philosophy, public policy, the arts, the professions, or any of a range of social domains. However, in addition to uh, critiquing merely Christian uh, cultural content, the Christian university should also be engaged in, four, replacing poor content uh, with good. That means that we need scholars capable of producing art quality, artistic, and intellectual content to be submitted to the marketplace of ideas. This is the stuff of culture, the building blocks out of which our markets, uh, our advertising, our arts, all of our daily interactions uh, are built. Additionally, we need scholars who can produce thinkers 
of such a time. Our challenge at Baylor has been to transform our institution's culture from one that ex has exclusively specialized in the first two um, items I mentioned, namely educating students morally and preparing students uh, for leadership. We have exclusively specialized in the first two, and it has been part of our agenda to uh, seek to transform our own institutional culture into one that includes the second two, and to do so, and in so doing, to become a Christian university in, I think, a, a classic sense uh, of that term. It has required a broadening of our understanding of our calling and, I think, uh, the tenure uh, vision, the development of it that I have referred to, is an exercise not only in excellence but also in faithfulness. So now if I could, uh, I'm, I'm not sure, are my time limits gone here? John, I haven't uh, glanced at my watch. Let me mention uh, a few specific things that we are doing that relate to this uh, uh, tenure vision that um, I think uh, suggest at least our agenda for influencing culture and, and bringing life, but also transforming our institution. Uh, our tenure vision has 12 uh, imperatives, and uh, it is... Um, I won't mention all of them. You may be thankful for that. Um, uh, they have to do with endowment and athletics and um, the facilities and so on. But let me mention a few things that, that do, I think, uh, get at the, at the core of the, of the matters uh, germane to us today. Uh, our tenure vision uh, has as one of its imperatives the, uh, the attempt to assure that our students and faculty interact in an environment conducive to learning and development. And for us, that means uh, student-faculty ratios as, as one example. We, we have approached nearly 19 to 1 in our student-faculty ratios. We have uh, as one of our goals to see that ratio go down to something in the 12s to 1. That's a very costly thing for us to do. But we think that in so doing, we, we will cultivate uh, a, a habit of, habits of, of teaching and, and learning which will enable students to, to again, develop the kinds of, of habits of, of uh, of leadership and critique and thinking that will stand them in good stead uh, as they uh, attempt to become a salt and light in the world. Um, a second imperative, um, uh, and, and I must say, in, in, to, to accomplish that first imperative, that means hiring more faculty and bringing in fewer students, and we did uh, both of those uh, this year. It's a very costly thing to do. Secondly, uh, an, another imperative is that uh, we're working, and I must admit to having borrowed uh, the thought here from uh, some, a document uh, of Notre Dame's that I read a number of years ago, uh, we want to create a truly residential campus. That is in our history, but it is no longer in our present reality. Uh, I often, when I talk to our alumni about Baylor 2012, I often with envy refer uh, to Notre Dame. And if, this, if what I'm about to say is not true, please don't correct me. It makes such a good story to tell. But I, I, uh, I often tell people that uh, my understanding is that an undergraduate for four or five years stays in the same dormitory. Is that still the, the case? Uh, I, I even make the point that the dormitories don't have to be that good. Uh, but the, uh, there's no judgment on yours. Uh, but that, uh, but that it, it represents the building of tradition. It represents the building of relationships. And that when Notre Dame grads meet one another, they are not likely, nearly as likely to ask what club did you belong to, uh, what national fraternity or sorority did you belong to, as they are to ask what dorm did you live in. Uh, that says something, I think, about, or at least that, that works to create some of the things that I think are very important for a Christian institution. Uh, so we're, we're making some dramatic uh, efforts to change our culture in that regard, to recover a culture that we had. About, uh, as I speak, about uh, 25 or 30 percent of our students, uh, essentially only freshmen, live on our campus. But by the end of our 10 years, uh, we expect to see at least 50 percent, and my hope is that we won't stop until we have 70 or 80 percent of our students uh, living in university-sponsored housing. And that's not just housing that we own, but housing that that uh, in terms of program, in terms of sponsorship, in terms of, uh, of spiritual uh, uh, caretaking, that, uh, that we, uh, in terms of leadership and, and community building and, and people skills, that, that we uh, have the kind of housing that our students not only will enjoy living in, but will be uh, nurtured by. That's, again, a very costly uh, thing for us, 
but we're doing it. A third imperative calls upon us to build a world-class faculty, and I have to say again that uh, uh, a, uh, someone from uh, Notre Dame, let's see, we brought uh, Father, someone help me here, Father Mark, uh, no, who? No, I'm sorry, I'm just leaving me for the moment, but a former provost here at uh, Notre Dame came, and uh, it's before, who was before Nathan Hatch? It was Timothy O'Meara. It was Timothy O'Meara. He came, and uh, he uh, came to a, a faculty retreat, not a faculty retreat, but an executive council retreat, and we talked to him about faculty and the importance of faculty, and that was a point that uh, became very clear to us, that we cannot have an outstanding university, nor can we have the kind of university that we envision without investing in faculty. And so that is uh, something that we are, are doing in, uh, with, with gusto. Uh, we are often told, well, you can't have uh, academically excellent faculty and a Christian university. It just can't be done, and you have to compromise uh, on your Christian identity. We have found precisely the opposite to be the case, that the more we are willing to tell people who we are, the more we are willing to be faithful to our own historic identity, and to be upfront about that, the more attractive we are to uh, scholars who share those commitments and who also have uh, outstanding academic credentials. So we are in a golden age of uh, faculty uh, classes. And I've been able to say every year for the last four or five years that this is the most outstanding uh, new faculty in the history of Baylor. Well, uh, academic programs, uh, some other things. I, I think I'll, I'll stop there. I had a couple of the things, but I know I've used my time up. But uh, uh, we think it's very important for us as an institution of higher learning uh, to, uh, to have both uh, an environment and a curriculum that uh, contributes uh, to uh, the lives of our students so that they may contribute life uh, to our culture and that, that we have the opportunity to, to be of enormous influence as an institution of higher learning. Thank you, John. Thank you, Dr. Sloan. Finally, I am proud to be able to present our own president, Reverend Edward A. Malloy, CSC, president of the University of Notre Dame, known better on the home front as well as abroad simply as Monk. Father Malloy is in his third five-year term as president of the University of Notre Dame, the university's 16th president he was elected by the Board of Trustees in 1986 after having served five years as Vice President and Associate Provost. Monk holds an appointment as Professor in the Department of Theology, and I would like to point out, as his Department Chair, still teaches, conducting a seminar for first-year undergraduates each semester. His latest book, Monk's Reflections, follows two earlier influential studies on areas understudied at the time of writing, one on the ethics of policing and the other on issues of homosexuality and Christian ethics. He's also the author of more than 50 articles and book chapters in scholarly journals and other venues. An ethicist by training, he is a member of the Catholic Theological Society of America and the Society of Christian Ethics. Father Malloy holds a BA and an MA in English from the University of Notre Dame and an MA in theology, a master's degree in theology from the University of Notre Dame, which he earned while studying for the priesthood. He earned his doctorate in Christian ethics from Vanderbilt University in 1975, and Vanderbilt honored him in 1998 with the establishment of a chair in Catholic studies in his name. He has also been awarded 12 honorary degrees. Father Malloy's service to higher education includes membership on the boards of Vanderbilt University and the universities of Portland and St. Thomas, leadership roles as chair of the American Council on Education, the Association of Governing Boards of Universities and Colleges, and participation on the Business Higher Education Forum, the General Council of the International Federation of Catholic Universities, and the board of the Association of Catholic Colleges and Universities. Monk also has played a leadership role in efforts to promote community service and combat substance abuse 
as, among other things, member of the National Advisory Council on Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism and President Bush's Advisory Council on Drugs. He has served the Catholic Church on the Vatican Secretariat for Nonbelievers, the Ex Corde Ecclesiae and Bishops Presidents Committees of the U.S. Catholic Conference, the World Congress of Catholic Education, and the Sister Thea Bowman Black Catholic Educational Foundation. And I can out that he is also a recipient of the National Association of Basketball Coaches Val Fulver Anniversary Award given to former varsity basketball players who have distinguished themselves in leadership and service. I'm sure you'll all join me in welcoming to the podium Father Monk Malone. The reason that Don didn't think it was extraordinary to have uh, seven children is he had children himself. So it just seemed like the normal course of events. Also, I am also in a Father Dowling mystery. Maybe more than one, but at least one that I've read. Welcome to Notre Dame. Often my responsibility is to come to sessions like this and welcome those who have come from the outside and leave. I can't get away with that this time, but welcome. I hope you enjoy the campus. It's a beautiful place, we think. Uh, safe. You have two uh, lakes to walk around and if you can get away from the interaction among yourselves, uh, I'm sure you'll find a, a lot of relief in the beauty of nature. Last night at uh, Gannon College in Erie, Pennsylvania, I gave a 40-minute talk on the future of Catholic higher education, which I'm not going to give today. Uh, I would like uh, to build a little bit on some of the things that the previous two speakers have touched and maybe take a slightly different direction so that in our conversation, we can think about the full range of, of issues that need to be brought to the table uh, for a full-blown fl full full uh, reflection on this uh, very important matter. I should say, first of all, that I am overall very optimistic and hopeful about the future of Christian education. My experience here at Notre Dame has been very rewarding for me. Uh, to see the enthusiasm and the, and the sense of commitment that can be pervasive in these kinds of institutions, not without uh, fights, debates, disagreements, and occasionally acrimonious accusations. But I think on the whole, uh, the people in this institution and many of the other Christian institutions that I've had a chance to visit are very proud of what has been achieved there, uh, hopeful that uh, we can build on that solid foundation and also acutely aware of the difficulty of continuing and sustaining these institutions in the face of what is sometimes a hostile culture. Let me say, first of all, since the carrying force of these institutions is the faculty, not the administration and not the student body, it's extremely important for us who are the faculty members and how they get uh, chosen from moment to moment and year to year. Notre Dame, unlike many of our Catholic University uh, uh, peer institutions, uh, ask, ask at the time of hire uh, a self-described uh, religious affiliation or none. Uh, that is a minimal kind of uh, test. But the fact that it is not engaged in by many of our peer institutions suggests that they think uh, these goals will be achieved by osmosis or by some kind of other uh, principle of, of magnetism. My own experience is that these institutions will not take seriously the question of hiring and attracting a committed Catholic faculty end up all of their peer institutions that have the same reward structure and level of prestige. There will be nothing that will uh, distinguish uh, a Christian institution, institution under Christian auspices and foundation from their peer institutions if the hiring of faculty who are committed to the mission and identity is not uh, taken on in a vigorous fashion. One of the strategies that we've tried to employ in this regard is not only asking the question and trying to engage the goodwill and enthusiasm 
of the leadership of the departments and colleges and members of the A and P committees of the various uh, groups, uh, but also to uh, uh, to try to uh, entertain in the early stages of one's career a kind of familiarization with the campus as a whole, what makes it tick, to share something about the nature, how, how the uh, the mission and identity of the institution uh, manifests itself day after day and week after week. So a lot of things have gone on. We've tried to prime ourselves for a more vigorous look at people who are hired. Uh, we've tried to make money available through the provost office for target of opportunity hiring, which includes the category of those uh, who fit the religious mission and identity of the institution. And we've tried to do a better and more comprehensive job of uh, initiating or welcoming people who will join the faculty community. Uh, I think this is an imperative that's not going to go away. It's, uh, it's of course, uh, debatable about what the, f the, the, the pool looks like in a given discipline at a given moment. One of the worst dilemmas is to allow the identification of faculty to be hired to be so narrowed that, uh, in a sense, there's only two people in the world that could ever fulfill the expectation. It's really important within a broad discipline uh, to maintain maximum flexibility so that, uh, in a very realistic way, a department can aspire to improve the quality of its uh, productivity, its uh, quality of its teaching, and so on, and still be faithful to the mission in its hiring process. So. My first thought, it's crucial, necessary, to pay attention, attention to the hiring of faculty who religiously fit the mission. Uh, I think I have a second obligation connected to that, those of us that are research universities, to prepare the faculty who will be available for these kinds of hires in the future. It's interesting that a school like Notre Dame, in addition to attracting Catholic graduate students, has attracted a lot of graduate students very interested in working in Christian institutions in the future. So one of the things that we are doing with some degree of deliberation is trying to take this building the pool question very seriously. There are some organized efforts to take that on at the national level. We've tried to participate in those in a very cooperative way. A second area of interest and concern uh, has to do with the governing boards of these institutions. In a sense, uh, all of my authority is derivative. I am elected by the Board of Trustees. I am approved for continuation. All the officers are. Many of the fundamental decisions about priorities in these institutions are legally entrusted to the Board of Trustees. In 1967, uh, Notre Dame uh, took the initiative, along with a couple of other Catholic institutions, to move to a predominantly lay board of trustees, which has grown in size to a maximum of 60, but has within it a board of fellows, which is half clerical and half lay, and which has a special responsibility to pay attention to matters related to mission and identity. It's a protective mechanism. In fact, the board of trustees does the vast majority of work of uh, governance and oversight function for the university, but I think it, is, it has served us very well. And in times of uh, debate and controversy about matters related to identity mission and, and uh, the future, uh, the Board of uh, Fellows, as well as the Board of Trustees, has stepped up and is very uh, and deeply committed to assuring that we pass on to the next generation uh, the most precious thing we have to offer which is our distinctiveness. We cannot say often enough that the distinctiveness of an institution of higher education, presuming that it's uh, compatible, in this case with, uh, with Christian uh, a sense of calling, uh, is our greatest strength. If you think about historically uh, all female institutions or military academies or liberal arts colleges or schools for the arts and so on, uh, if they moved away from the things that were their hallmark, then there would be a, a great hullabaloo about 
uh, how they were being unfaithful to their sense of mission. The seductive possibility with these kinds of institutions is that it happens uh, by default. And so it's very important for us to, uh, not only in our uh, fundraising documents and in our appeal to our alumni, but also in the way that we try to relate to the rest of higher education and to the broader culture, uh, to affirm uh, constantly in appropriate ways, some symbolic and others uh, simply part of the ordinary life of the institution, that we are a certain kind of institution, we're proud of it, and we're trying to let our planning for the future flow out of that identity. A third thing has to do with uh, the way in which we organize our academic life. One, of course, has to do with curriculum. Uh, our institution it has a core curriculum for all of our undergraduate students. Uh, I think that has served us well. No matter what college the undergraduate students might study within, they all have a kind of, uh, I hope, a solid basis that will provide uh, a schooling in, in the broad, uh, deep sense of the history of di different disciplines and the cultures out of which we come, uh, but also uh, can remind us that that hyper-specialization is often gained as a, as a kind of enemy of breadth of knowledge, learning, and a capacity for lifetime involvement. The fact that we have, as a department, a great books program is, the, is very consistent with the kind of thing that we're trying to do for the student population as a whole. My predecessor, Father Ted Hesburgh, who was an extraordinary leader in higher education, uh, one of the ways in which he tried, before he stepped down, to incorporate a sense of mission in terms of the curriculum and the academic priorities was to help establish a number of institutes and centers that were related very much to foundational questions like war and peace, like justice in the economic order, like civil and human rights, uh, to try and look at issues like church-state relationships and all of those kinds of things, the, the circumstances of those who were unrepresented in the broader political process. These are the kind of things uh, that any good university could take on, but they seem to have a particular uh, fit and compatibility with the way we see ourselves as an academic institution. Another uh, dimension of this has to do with student life. You were kind to say uh, nice things about our, our uh, residential tradition here at Notre Dame. I think it's a mistake for us to so emphasize that that we underestimate the importance of what happens in the classroom and in the other learning environments because that's why we exist. But it is, I believe, the case from my experience as a student, as a uh, dorm mentor, as a sometime assistant rector and one time an acting rector, and now as a priest in residence in one of our male dorms, that uh, this is where we take on the challenge of trying, in a sense, to deal with the whole person. The religious dimension, all of our chapels here, or all of our dorms have chapels and regular religious services. We have a beautiful uh, basilica on the campus uh, with both upstairs and downstairs wor worship opportunities. Uh, we try to very much uh, focus on the quality of liturgical music with a great variety of forms. Uh, various kinds of programming under the auspices of our campus ministry and our Center for Social Concerns. Uh, I like to think that we keep, we keep uh, trying to find the right mix between prayer, uh, community building, and the kind of service that we feel called to render to uh, the campus community, to the surrounding neighborhoods, and to the rest of the country and the world during break time in the summers and after graduation. I was very active in a group, a Campus Compact, which is uh, trying to promote the whole area of service learning at the national level. Many of the early members of that were religiously affiliated, but then it became, uh, thankfully, much more pervasive. And the notion of service learning is, of course, not only to make a difference, to have your senses touched by the reality of other people's lives, less fortunate than yourselves or by other cultures, but also to bring the questions that are derived from that experience back into the classroom, to really transform the kind of conversation that goes on. 
To do that is wonderful. But to do it from a distinctively Christian frame of reference and to do it with fundamental religious and theological questions being brought to the fore seems to me to be what a full-blown and expansive notion of Christian education should look like. The last thing I would say is I think it, it makes a big difference who the leadership group is administratively in the institution, who the president is, who the officers are, and uh, to what extent they are effective agents of mediation and of oversight and enthusiastic advocacy for the kind of sense of mission and identity that these institutions would like to convey. Uh, this institution has a restriction that the presidency is only open to a Holy Cross priest of the Indiana province of the Congregation of Holy Cross. It sounds very restrictive. Uh, it clearly limits the pool. Uh, I believe that that has served the institution well and will continue to serve the institution well. But it also means that we have an obligation and responsibility here to foster lay leadership. Uh, if not in the presidency role, in all the other roles, at least uh, as would evolve over the course of time. I was involved uh, a couple of months ago in a conversation that was subsidized by uh, one of the foundations in which we brought together a core group of Catholic leaders to talk about how Catholic institutions can prepare for the future that was described in terms of the number of institutions that have moved in the direction of having lay presidents and a higher percentage of lay leaders. Uh, I don't think there's anything inherently detrimental to the movement to lay leadership insofar as we can foster a continuation, a healthy and, and solid and, and excellent continuation of the relationship to a diocese in the Catholic world or a founding religious community, I think that's all to the good. But it would be more realistic for all of us to recognize that the sense of continuity and history and kind of shared preparation that has been the hallmark of many of the religious communities is not so readily available to those entrusted with lay leadership in the same institutions. So we have to find uh, organizational structures and preparatory frameworks by which that dimension uh, can take place uh, with greater degree of confidence. So to sum up, uh, I think there are, uh, there continue to be uh, significant issues. Uh, none of this happens uh, without forethought and, and uh, articulation of goals and getting uh, support from the right set of constituencies. There are always people suspicious in an institution like Notre Dame. They, they would sometimes equate pre preservation of the religious mission and identity with mediocrity in hiring or in promotion standards or in some other kind of way. I do not believe that that's the case. I like to think that Notre Dame has been at least one example that, that this set of complex issues and sometimes conflicting goals can be uh, continually sought after in a way that uh, it can be relatively harmonious and that can be a kind of model for the kind of world that I hope becomes more characteristic across the whole network of Christian uh, educational institutions. So great to have you here and look forward to the conversation. Thank you, Father Malloy. Friends, uh, the floor is now open for questions and discussions. discussion. You'll notice that we have two microphones set up. So if you have a question or a comment, please approach one of the microphones. And please identify yourself for those of us who don't know you. If you address your question or comment to one member of the panelist, I will give that person the first chance to reply, but we'll also ask the other panelists if they have a comment on the question. Yes, sir. Yeah, Arthur Bowman, uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. To uh, President Sloan, uh, you, Baylor wants to be a tier one university. The question is, uh, who decides if you're tier one and why the credibility for that body to uh, define who you are rather externally rather than internally? Thank you. Uh, by Tier 1, I'm referring to the ranking system of the U.S. News and World Report. Uh, and um, 
it is the most widely used uh, ranking system. We chose uh, that one uh, because we thought the Carnegie classification system uh, did not have uh, canons of, uh, or criteria that were as uh, consistent with, with our own internal goals. For the U.S. News and World Report criteria have to do, it's a very student-oriented set of criteria. Whereas the old Carnegie classification system, I say the old Carnegie classification system, emphasized federal research dollars and numbers of PhDs. But this one emphasizes uh, student-faculty ratios. It emphasizes you get, you get a, a bonus for classes under 20. You get a hickey for classes uh, above 50. You, uh, you have, uh, I, I thought you'd laugh. Uh, that, that word actually has an older history than what our young people think it does. Uh, the, um, you get uh, it's the per student endowment, the per student operating budget, uh, the number of alums who, who give, and so on. So it's a very student-oriented, I think, set of criteria, except for probably the, the lar no doubt the largest domain, which is academic reputation, which is simply a survey done by peer institutions. Of, uh, again, it is it is more important for us to be faithful to our own internal vision and identity than to achieve that ranking system. And all institutions, we, we annually say that we don't pay any attention to these and they're not important as we uh, you know get the ink all over our thumbs uh, looking through them, through, through the magazine. They are important because people look at them. And it is a way uh, albeit imperfect, it is a way for institutions to compare themselves with one another. And I think uh, one of the ways that it's important for us and thus and, and is consistent with our uh, efforts at faithfulness is that we are simply in the world, though not of the world. And uh, it's important for us. Uh, I think it gains, uh, you gain visibility. U.S. News and World Report, that particular issue uh, by far outsells every other issue that they publish. So it, it's, it's looked at, it's read, and it's, it in itself is a cultural influence with regard to higher education. Thank you, though. President Stockerty or Malone or Malloy? Yeah, I would second most of that. Um, I think it represents a kind of consumerism uh, that, that we're faced with. It's, it's, um, uh, on the one hand, it's a kind of accountability that's probably a good thing for us in the long run. On the other hand, it, it introduces um, uh, criteria that are in many ways extraneous. Uh, I, I think the measures are important ones, but the final measure is the fit between that institution, that climate, that culture, that history, and the needs of an individual student, undergraduate, graduate, that family's expectations, et cetera. And none of those things are, uh, are as easily measured as, as these polls. But uh, it is a fact. It creates its own fact uh, because it's a perception. And so um, for better or for worse, I think this is what we live with for the near future. Nobody wants to be a prisoner of such uh, polls. Um, we do constant benchmarking as an institution and also within our various units. We don't want to be complacent. I, I like the pressure that comes with, uh, with seeing what top tier, what people think of as top tier institutions are, are taking on and the kind of resource base that they've been able to attract and make the case to uh, potential benefactors that we're doing it a different way, but we'd like to think that we can do it with the same degree of excellence that others seem to see in in the institutions that are in the top uh, rank. We have, have had the good fortune of being in the top 20 in the, in the university uh, appraisal for, for a number of years now. Uh, if we dropped out of there and if we're, for the right reasons, that wouldn't be any great problem. But the fact that we're there, I think, suggests to at least some people that it's possible to be faithful to your identity and mission and still be thought of by your peers in, in a general way as being an outstanding academic institution, and I think that's a good thing. You are next, sir. I think, I think actually he was next. You're next. Thank you. Um, I'm Jeff Senzig. I'm an undergraduate at St. Louis University. Um, one of the central documents uh, that these set of conferences has been based on is Evangelium Vitae, the Gospel of Life. Um, to what extent and I think we've heard this implicitly, and I guess I just want to hear this explicated. Um, what do you see the role of the Christian university being in terms of evangelization and bringing the gospel, not only the gospel of life to the world, but also um, the fullest understanding of the human person through the life, death, and resurrection of Christ and bringing that to the world? And that's open to all three. 
I'll let you start. Here we go. Well, I think that um, we have to regard uh, evangelization in a couple of ways. One is, uh, I think our own Catholic students uh, need attention on those matters. I mean, I, I don't think I don't think we don't. We don't think of it as the Catholic students have got it, and, and now we've got to pass it on to others. I, I think that uh, the, the depth of insight of some of our Catholic students requires constant attention on these matters to have opportunities for them to discuss deep in their faith, have, have uh, opportunities for prayer, retreats, that kind of thing. So I see that as a field of uh, evangelization. <laughs> Sorry for that word. Uh, but I think when, when you're dealing with, with uh, people in uh, other faiths, other Christian traditions, uh, Jews, Muslims, uh, Hindus on our campus, uh, that requires a very light touch. Um, uh, it's open, uh, which is to say that all of our uh, religious activities are available to them if they want. Uh, we have uh, interfaith discussions. We have a, uh, uh, a one God, one world organization in which uh, people of like-minded from different religious traditions meet on a regular basis to discuss uh, uh, these issues. Um, but I think that uh, at least uh, our own tradition tells us that respect for other traditions is a very, very important groundwork in, in terms of the fundamental respect for one another as human beings. Um, I, I don't think they're exclusive, but I think that, as I say, it's, it's a gentle touch in those areas. I don't know. It's like the word love, the word evangelization uh, is awfully, you know, I want to find another term just because it has a history and, and a kind of a reaction by different people. Um, I think uh, about 85% of our undergraduate students, just to start with that group, describe, or describe themselves as Catholic when they come. And that's been pretty steady through the years. So the vast majority of those who come here uh, are self-described Catholics. Uh, we try, insofar as we can, to, in our uh, dorm life and in our broader uh, religious uh, outreach, to serve that population as effectively as we can so that they have a chance to assimilate uh, the, d the depth and richness of their religious heritage and to celebrate it in worship and to and to do deal with it in the the classes in theology and in other disciplines in a more sophisticated way than they were able to do when they were younger. So I think we have a huge evangelization mission to those who come here as Catholic students. We also have an obligation to provide an opportunity for Protestant, uh, Orthodox, and then other religious tradition students to participate in their religious heritage while they're with us, at least make that opportunity available for them off the campus or on, depending on the circumstances. Um, the conversation that often goes on between students who are from different denominational backgrounds who are Christian or Christians with those from other religious traditions is an opportunity for people to speak from the heart and share the treasure that is theirs. What the result of that will be is a work of grace, presumably. Uh, and uh, I don't know that we can ever gerrymander the outcome. But as a university, we want to be as, as respectful as we can. Uh, and of course, there is, uh, with the religions of the book, a special historical relationship that also has to be appreciated. So uh, we don't want to underplay uh, the way we try to serve in an explicit way the vast majority of our students, and then not quite the same percentage in the other levels of, of, of students but still, still a significant one, and then how we serve the rest of the students and those who come to us as searchers. I mean, I, I think there's more searchers out there than there are people that have uh, explicit, strong religious feelings. And uh, if you go to, to uh, the Easter Vigil service at the, at the Basilica, we, I don't know, we average somewhere like 15 to 30 people who either become full-fledged Catholic members who have other histories or have no religious history and and choose to be to be baptized I think that's a pretty good sign that there is a kind of an evangel evangelization going on but none of this is required by anybody and I think that reflects a little bit of, of the attitude of the institution 
as I understand uh, evangelization, it involves this core of the gospel, which orients itself around the uh, death and resurrection of Christ and the dissemination of that message such that others learn the message and uh, in, in, uh, uh, when uh, there is a work of grace, uh, appropriate that and internalize it uh, for themselves and become thus followers of Christ. I think that is a very legitimate and necessary uh, work of the church and thus also of the Christian university, which is in a sense an arm of the church. Uh, I think it would be a mistake to understand that, <clears throat> excuse me, that uh, radiating core um, of the gospel and thus the task uh, of evangelism as, as isolated because it does, as I think you've heard uh, um, the other two panelists suggest, it does radiate outward uh, in terms of the fullness of life. Um, uh, in, in, even in your question, uh, in terms of what it means to be truly human, and, and I would say, and thus to live fully uh, in the world. So there are, there are behaviors uh, which include uh, research, for example, that are a legitimate expression of the, the faith and faithfulness of Jesus Christ. So um, I, I, my mind always drifts back to uh, Paul on Mars Hill uh, preaching the gospel of Christ but doing so in a way that has embraced uh, the setting in which he finds himself. He quotes pagan, a pagan poet and a pagan philosopher, and, uh, and, and yet enculturating that message does not uh, completely lose that message and, and thus touches and embraces all of life. Friends, we have less than five minutes remaining in our session. Perhaps you've been waiting there so patiently. We have a brief last question. Okay. Um, my, my question is for all three panelists, um, but uh, please excuse me, Dr. S Dr. Sloan. I am, I'm Catholic, um, and uh, so I'll be phrasing the question in terms of Catholicism, but please feel free to answer in terms of your own tradition. Oh, but by the way, I'm Tom Harmon from Gonzaga University. Um, my concern is that it seems that um, um, within the curriculum of the, university, of the, the Catholic University, um, it seems that all intellectual traditions are uh, given, given the same weight, especially in the core curriculum. And so what results is that the, the student comes away um, without a sense of the coherence of the Catholic worldview. And I'm wondering if, uh, if you can respond to that and may, maybe suggest um, if I'm, in fact, wrong about that or um, what can be done better about that. Thanks. One of the reasons that we have uh, invested heavily, proportionately, in our philosophy and theology departments here is because uh, we wanted to provide uh, two uh, strong disciplinary presences, uh, which are both incorporated in the core curriculum for our students, and to hire faculty who overall are both sympathetic and and uh, very uh, competent and able articulators of connections between uh, theological and religious positions and the world of learning in general. Um, I'm not saying I would never make the claim that every class that someone takes is uh, necessarily of that kind, but in the end, uh, Every time you reform curriculum or demand certain courses of certain content, it's always a, a function of who's doing it, the people that are involved in the process. And my experience has been that these departments and others, uh, which are, are, are cri critical in their own way, are giving uh, our students uh, tools to make uh, discerning judgments about uh, claims, about uh, various traditions of competence and and so on. It's just the whole question of methodology uh, or, or uh, implicit uh, theoretical positions in the, in the world of higher learning, which tend to poo-poo uh, truth claims of one kind or another. Um, it seems to me that in these kinds of universities, we have uh, wonderful advocates, but also thoughtful uh, uh, people to discuss the relationship. Thank you. Thank you.
So anyway, I, 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 I believe that having strong uh, theology and philosophy departments as part of the core curriculum is a desirable and necessary step toward the goal of having a coherent curriculum. Well, quickly, um, we make an effort, of course, to introduce elements of other traditions into our core curriculum to globalize our globalize our curriculum and uh, and and to give people, uh, you know, a sense of uh, uh, that there are other ways of looking at things. But I would be surprised if anyone could look at our curriculum and and characterize it that all traditions were treated equally. I mean. Uh, our theology department be overwhelmingly Catholic theology. Our philosophy department is grounded in phenomenology. Uh, m most of our other traditions are very plainly Western, which is rooted in Christianity. So uh, I would say we're making an effort to, uh, to be more diverse, but not at the, uh, at the cost of, of a clear uh, a core of, of, of a world viewpoint. I would just add from the point of view of I would call this a Christian university, I'm reminded of uh, Father Newhouse's uh, thesis that there, uh, there is no such thing as a university pure and simple. And I agree strongly with that. There's not a university pure and simple, there's not a professor pure and simple, and there's not a curriculum pure and simple. And uh, to, to assume that there is any neutrality would be a mistake. Uh, we, we have an intellectual tradition as Christian universities, uh, and, and thus we, we, do, we should uh, maintain those. Having said that, it is vital, of course, that that's not done in, in a um, in an overly restrictive sense. And one of the ways that I know we um, make sure that we have a, a, a uh, that we introduce the students broadly to embrace the world as an expression of our Christian identity is through a great text program. You mentioned your great text program. We we have just instituted a, a great text program. It's it's not what I would call a a University of Chicago style great text program, but it does incorporate no doubt many of the texts that would be in a kind of University of Chicago list, but it is, uh, it also uh, has a canon, uh, you know, the, the shape of that canon is, is very important too, but that I think on the one hand, depending upon the shape of that canon of great texts, or you can both uh, uh, privilege and make clear the, the tradition in which uh, the, the, the university is located, and at the same time, ask uh, those universal questions that are uh, part and parcel of the human uh, experience. Friends, before we disperse to continue our conversation more informally, we have one remaining obligation, and that's to thank our distinguished panelists. Great, thanks. Great.